Welcome everyone to this session on women's climate leadership. We are very excited to see you all here. I think that we will wait uh, a little bit to to um, to welcome additional participants. But in the meanwhile, um, I will start um, sharing some housekeeping messages. First, please note that this session is being recorded by IID and that parts of it may be posted on our website at a later stage. Um, secondly, please do not share the Zoom link to join this meeting on social media. This will help us reduce the risk of Zoom bombing activity. Uh, next slide, please, the housekeeping rules. We ask you to please update your name and add your organization, and you can do this if you select on participants at the bottom of your screen on the menu and um, select the rename option. Um, um, gentle reminder that if you have any technical difficulties, please write to us in the chat box and we will aim to help you. Um, we will use Mentimeter during this event so we can hear your views and learn from you. So we will share the link later. So prepare, be prepared for that. And to get started, we invite you all to introduce yourself in the chat box and tell us your name, your organization, the place you are connecting from, and your favorite food. In my case, it's Mexican mushroom tacos. Great. Welcome, everyone. Great. Next slide, please. Next. Great. That one. This session is co-hosted by the Climate Investment Funds, Engine Collaborative, and IID in collaboration with the Rights and Resources Initiative, the Asian Development Bank, Huayru Commission, and SSP. This session is framed by the CIFS Women's Leadership Initiative, in which NGEN and IID are collaborating to examine the barriers and enablers of women's climate leadership in just transition, renewable energy integration, climate adaptation, nature-based solutions. In this session, we explore what women's climate leadership means in the context of LLA. Next slide, please. And um, given that this is a conference about LLA, um, this is closely related to LLA principle number two, which advocates for addressing the structural inequalities faced by women, indigenous peoples, and other traditionally marginalized groups. And this means ensuring their meaningful participation in leading adaptation decisions and ensuring exclusive streams of adaptation finance to be led by traditionally excluded groups. Next slide, please. At the local level, we believe that advancing women's climate leadership also means advancing effective and just climate adaptation. On the other hand, um, this, um, we know that uh, the gender, gender uh, economic and political inequalities that disempower women, such as discrimination, gender-based violence, lack of access to finance, pervasive gender norms, are the same structural issues that determine exposure of vulnerability to climate hazards. Next, click. So uh, addressing these structural issues underpinning climate risk means strengthening women's empowerment. Next while at the same time reducing the climate risk for women and other marginalized groups. Uh, during our work, we, have we found evidence that at the grassroots level, meaningful engagement and participation of women in climate decision-making spaces and the leadership, especially of women's organizations, is key to mobilizing and responding quickly for local adaptation, nature-based solutions, disaster risk reduction initiatives, and all of this is essential to address climate risks. And evidence also shows that diversity in decision-making spaces also allows for different perspectives to be included in decision-making. In decision making. And thus, this includes the quality of decision-making, which in turn contribute to locally led adaptation. Next. And finally, climate adaptation finance is key both to support women's climate leadership processes and to support effective LLA. Um, but the logic of women's uh, climate leadership is not only about efficiency, but about rights and justice. 
Today, we have a fantastic panel of women's leaders from various sectors, from the grassroots, the government community, the donor community, NGOs, and we will hear from them on what they think they are the enablers, barriers, and opportunities for advancing women's climate leadership. But before that, we would like to turn our attention to you so that you can tell us what you think women's climate leadership means in the context of locally led adaptation. And for that, I hand over to May, who will facilitate the first interactive session. Uh, so to you, over to you, May. Okay, I trust that you can see my screen. Can we have a thumbs up from everyone? If you can see my screen. Yeah, great. So you may already be familiar with Mentimeter, but if not, um, please go to menti.com and enter the code in 82589242. And over there, you'll be asked a question. What does women's climate leadership mean to you? And Rakesh, I saw you in the plenary earlier, so you were already well versed on this topic. We'd love to hear what women's climate leadership means to you. You want me to commence the um, discussion? I would suggest that both me, I, and another person, we've already said what we wanted to say. I would rather love others, uh, love to hear others, and then come on whenever it's required to. Yes, let's hear from others. Um, if you could go to menti.com enter in the code and then share your perspective on what women's climate leadership means. Uh, go for it. <clears throat> okay, we have one response. Women's climate leadership means true participation in decision making and not tokenistic. It also means leveraging representation across different spheres. So saying that there's diverse representation from different people of different backgrounds. Women's climate leadership means breaking down barriers and being able to meaningfully participate and influence climate planning and decision making. It means equity, fully engaged at all levels with their needs, being heard, acknowledged and met. I'll give you one or two more minutes to finish up this question and then we can move to the next one. It also means challenging the structures that marginalize people based on gender and also other intersectional aspects. It means placing power into the hands of people who often know issues firsthand. It also means putting women in the center of adaptation planning and policy making processes. Okay, thank you so much for all these insights. Um, we will discuss them more in the panel, uh, but uh, next we'll go to the next slide where we have the same exercise. What do you think are the barriers to women's climate leadership in your country or the area of work that you are involved in? Give you a few minutes to think about the bar barriers of women's climate leadership. We have patriarchy, resources, social and cultural norms, gender stereotypes, discrimination. So panelists, I hope you're taking notes since you'll be reflecting on these. OK, 
capitalism as well. Okay, give you one more minute and then we can move to the next question. Cultural norms is emerging as a major barrier. Excellent. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, may, 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 if I may be permitted, just two more simple points that we discussed in our lack of education and lack of opportunities is one of the major barriers. <clears throat> yes. And I think um, lack of resources is the broader category um, okay. that relates to education as well. Thanks Thank so you. much. Okay, so let's talk about the enablers of women's climate leadership. Give you all a few minutes. Political will, if there is political will, it can be a big enabler of women's climate leadership. Um, there's also faith in legal and policy frameworks or formal rules to increase women's climate leadership. Flexible finance. I'd love to unpack some of these more from all of you. We'll have an interactive section in the in the end. So love to hear what you are all thinking with these words. Community buy-in, balancing household chores. Excellent. And we have one final slide. In your perspective, what is needed to strengthen women's climate leadership for locally led adaptation in your country or area of work? So this is bringing together women's climate leadership and LLA, local led adaptation, which is at the heart of CBA. What do you think is needed to strengthen women's climate leadership for locally led adaptation? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that was supposed to be the last question. So I'll continue to let you all think about it and then we'll come back to it at the end of the um, end of the session. <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, thank you very much for participating. And I will now hand over to Nina to talk about women's climate leadership and examples. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out, uh, can you see my uh, my PowerPoint or, or yes, not? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Uh, it's not it's not shared full screen, though. It's not shared full screen. Uh, sorry, um, to do, how to do this to share full screen. Uh, well, I mean, it, it is just one slide, um, but um, so thank you so much for, for 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 giving me the floor and for um inviting sif to be the co-host of this event and we're really excited to uh be able to interact with such a diverse group of participants um focusing specifically on um lla principles and how in connection with the lla principles we can think of women climate leadership climate investment funds um uh, is a facility that is working with uh, multilateral development banks, with the uh, six um, uh, six major multilateral development banks, and uh, has been over the years investing uh, very significantly both in mitigation and adaptation projects. And in our work, um, we try to make sure uh, that all of those investments have a, a focus on on gender. 
in the beginning, uh, if, if we look back at, at, at the very early projects at the beginning of our work, the, the focus was more on gender informed uh, approaches, gender informed projects. So we're making sure that gender is taken into account and that gender requirements are addressed and that there are some targets. Uh, and, and that was kind of the, the, the ambition at that level. Um, gradually, we had started to shift the focus more significantly on, on making sure that the projects are gender responsive. So uh, digging deeper at the level of the analysis uh, before the project is even uh, designed to identify what are the specific needs that women face in relationship to this um, either large infrastructure project or uh, a project that is foc focusing on renewable energy or on, on resilient agriculture. Where, where are women accessing those services differently and, and what can be done in order to uh, make sure that their um, access to, to them is facilitated. So we're looking um, at access to markets, uh, access to land and resources, and access to services. And within, within those categories, uh, designing various um, on-the-ground activities to, to, to make sure uh, that uh, equality uh, of access between uh, men and, and women was facilitated with the project activities um, as much as it was possible. But in the in the last few years, we've realized that this this is also not not enough. That without addressing structural, institutional, and normative barriers to equality, um, those type of activities are kind of like a, a band aid, but they're not really changing the systems that, that that create the inequalities. And we have raised our ambition to ensure that that projects uh, that SIF is supporting are gender transformative. We fully acknowledge that it's not always possible um, in, in, in the context of our work and that also um, it is still important to continue uh, working uh, and to ensure that uh, there is a level of gender informed, gender responsive elements and activities in the projects. But whenever possible, we try to, um, to now look at what are the structural reforms um, that could also be um, addressed directly or indirectly with the uh, project activities, um, as well as um, the, the uh, theme that we're discussing today uh, significantly is the voice and, and uh, agency and how through support to which kind of governance mechanisms and um, uh, what, what, um, what activities can be implemented to, to really um, make sure that, that that women play a more leadership role. So in the context of this work, uh, one of the activities that we're doing is our collaboration with IAAD and NGEN Collaborative to come up with a knowledge product that would combine both kind of really conceptual and, and, and academic approach to, to really try to understand it on, on rather deep level. Uh, what are the barriers? What are the opportunities for women climate leadership? Um, and not only in general, but really with, with application to specific sectors. How, how is it playing out uh, differently in different sectors? What are the regional, regional specifics? And the purpose of this knowledge product is not to just um, uh, to inform the, the broader debate, but we also see a very applied uh, use for it uh, as, as, as um, over the past two years, uh, SIF, um, SIF launched uh, a number of new uh, programs. Specifically, uh, there's a program on accelerated coal transitions, program on renewable energy integration. We're just um, in, in, in the um, final launch stage with the uh, nature-based solution program. Whilst the old programs, uh, several of the old programs are also continuing to run. And we're trying to come up with very applied recommendations that can be taking directly into the design of the new project. So this, this, this is our ambition and we see this session as also one of the, one of the sources of information um, that uh, from, from this conversation uh, with the panelists, but also with the audience uh, through the engagement, we can, we can get some, some, some really exciting ideas. Uh, we also will have a chance to apply some of those ideas through a particular um, a grant mechanism that uh, that we designed for one of the uh, one of the new programs, the accelerated coal uh, transitions program. Uh, we we have a grant mechanism that is called Walcott, women led coal transitions, where we. Um, uh, we will be working with, with our um, implementing partners, the multilateral development banks, to develop models for channeling uh, the um, 
sub, the, these grant, this grant funding, uh, finding formats for channeling the funding uh, down to the local level, to the local women groups, and uh, putting them actually in the driver's seat in deciding how this funding is used. Um, and, and, and that's what we see quite innovative. Again, we, we, we hope that the discussion today will inform this work going forward. So um, my speech mostly focused on, on going forward, on, on, on our ambition. Um, however, um, and although kind of formally we've only been focusing on gender transformative approach in, in the last few years, uh, if we look back at our portfolio of, pro of projects, we can actually find some interesting examples where we've had some successes uh, with it. Um, there are several programs that 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 come to mind, particularly our uh, forest investment program uh, FIP um, that has a direct grant mechanism that works with indigenous communities, uh, but uh, has quite a significant focus on gender with, within it, and we have some really interesting stories from that. Um, but I wanted to invite my colleague Irini to speak specifically about uh, another program that um, she's currently leading uh, a kind of evaluation or a knowledge product, really spotting specific examples of how uh, broader investments under that program has, has led to um, supporting uh, women leadership agenda. So over to Irini, thank you. Thank you, Nina, and thank you for um, inviting me. Nice to see everyone here. Um, so yes, as Nina mentioned, um, we are putting currently together a knowledge product focusing on women's climate leadership for the pilot program for climate resilience, our PPCR portfolio, which focuses on climate resilience. So the PPCR is at a mature stage of implementation. And for the last um, two, three years, we've been drawing lessons learned and good practices um, from our portfolio based on specific themes. Um, this learning and knowledge is captured under our Knowledge for Resilience series. And so far we focused on resilient, climate resilient infrastructure, whether in climate information services and local stakeholder engagement. And as Nina mentioned right now, we're collaborating with the gender team to focus on women's climate leadership. So from our research and, and data collection, um, we are finding that PPCR facilitates and promotes women's leadership in climate action, uh, primarily in three ways, which are very interrelated and connected to, to what we've heard so far. So the first one is enhancing women's access to an ownership of assets, whether these are financial, land, technologies. Um, the second one is enhancing women's um, economic empowerment and capabilities through employment, training, and education. And the third one is elevating women's agency and voice within formal and informal governance structures um, by increasing women's participation and representation in planning and decision-making bodies. So based on PPCR's experience and the knowledge product that we're putting together, some early findings and specific examples emerge. Um, so I'm briefly going to highlight um, three high-level findings and specific examples that, that show um, how PPCR is promoting women's climate leadership. So the first one is um, we're finding that enhancing women's access to finance for climate resilient activities is a key enabler for resilient livelihoods and economic empowerment, which in turn can promote women's um, climate leadership. Uh, in St. Lucia, for example, uh, the PPCR financed um, climate adaptation financing facility has enabled households and um, businesses to access concessional finance for building climate resilience of their assets and diversifying their livelihoods. Um, this facility is um, uh, gender, quite gender responsive, serving the needs of both men and women. And actually, as of June 2022, the share of female um, subloan borrowers is 60% against the 25% um, target. Similarly, in Tajikistan, we have another climate adaptation financing facility that provides finance um, to residents, farmers, and small businesses. About a third of the borrowers um, are were women, and women have actually reported social and economic improvements from accessing um, loans um, for climate resilient activities in the areas of reduced time po poverty, increased agricultural productivity, and also um, increasing their ability to influence financial decisions on assets and equipment. Um, and in Zambia, another example, um, 
that the BPCR has approved 96 adaptation subgrants for women individual champions. Um, and these subgrants, this access to additional financing is actually improving women's livelihood, increasing their incomes, um, and advancing their decision making and leadership. Um, I believe we'll hear more uh, from Chitembo about the Zambia experience. Uh, in terms of the second finding um, that relates to improving access to education, training, um, skills development and employment for in climate related fields, we are finding that this is another key enabler of women's climate leadership. Um, and a couple of examples emerge here as well. So for instance, through a PPCR project in Cambodia, um, women's knowledge and capacity for community-based disaster risk management has enabled women to um, lead and implement disaster risk management initiatives on the ground at community level, which is enhancing their protection and preparedness against floods and droughts, improving agricultural productivity, um, increasing their incomes and enhancing their resilient livelihoods. Uh, and we are finding that uh, their participation in community-based disaster risk management has also led to the recognition of the role in, in resilience and adaptation, and is slightly, it's starting to change gender relations. Um, in Nepal, the PPCR project is promoting women's educational attainment, um, where a third of the, the recipients of the scholarship that the project provided were women for tertiary level studies. Um, and another really um, good example to highlight here is the in Niger, where um, the project provided, PPCR projects provided hands-on technical training to women to ensure the uptake of climate resilient technologies, and in this case, um, drip irrigation technology. And this project we found, um, it basically allowed women to increase uh, their incomes through improved yields, ability to farm um, during the dry season, and um, higher uh, numbers Number of cropping cycles. And in terms of our last, our last high level finding, the last theme here, um, which pertains to elevated agency and voice within formal and informal governance structures, um, we are actually finding that the PPCR has been having some gender transformative results in this aspect. Um, and, and a key, key uh, finding here is that setting specific targets for women's representation in community, local or national planning and decision making bodies can actually empower them and increase the benefits they accrue from project activities. So to conclude here, a couple of examples to highlight um, the, cl the climate uh, financing facility in Tajikistan is actually starting to shift gender and social norms as the community is starting to recognize the benefits of women having access to finance for climate resilience and actually women taking on leadership role for climate resilience and adaptation initiatives. Um, in Cambodia, PPCR has improving women's representation in community governance structures, as well as women's um, participation in planning resources and uh, in planning processes. And this has led to the consideration of women's needs um, in project design and implementation. And lastly, in Niger, again, another good example, the PPCR actually used a gender sensitive approach to increase women's access to drip irrigation technology. Um, and we found that women were actually among the early adopters of this new irrigation systems. Um, and this uh, had, uh, as, as a consequence, um, these investments are also starting to shift the social dynamics um, and easing gender gaps by showing the, the value that women can bring uh, in climate resilience and adaptation. So these are just a few examples that we're finding uh, and that I wanted to highlight. Um, and just to let you know that this knowledge product is in, in the works and um, is forthcoming. So that's it uh, from, from my side over, over to Nina or, or whoever is um, taking the agenda forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nina and Irini, for sharing your insights and these examples. They're really exciting and really set the scene for an exciting discussion with our panelists. So panelists, can I ask you to turn on your cameras? Um, as Karen mentioned before, we have an exciting lineup of panelists that have represent a range of different perspectives on on women's climate leadership and um, can share a number of different examples as well. 
So panelists, I will ask you to introduce yourself. Um, so first, can I call on Nassim? Would you like to introduce yourself first? Not sure if you're still there, Nassim. We can come back to you. Um, Omaria, may I ask you to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Hey. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning from uh, Ithaca, New York, in the United States. And Omaira Bolaños, and originally from Colombia, but based here in the United States and work with the Rising Resources Initiative, uh, which is a global coalition uh, that works uh, towards securing the uh, collected tenure rights of indigenous Afro-descendant and local community, and I'm uh, focusing on the rights of women in collected uh, tenure. So we have a, a large program that we will share uh, later on that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chitembo, please go ahead. Hello everyone, and uh, thanks for, for inviting me to this. Um, I'm a development planner by profession and by practice, uh, working for over 15 years in the development space. Very interested in emerging issues such as climate change, uh, gender issues, the youth and population dynamics, how they influence uh, development outcomes how we ensure that that uh, takes into place and that overall the development planning systems, especially for developing countries, that has been my uh, focus for much of my career. And much more now focused on climate change the past six or almost seven years now, resilience building and adaptation. Uh, to be nice to have the discussions this, this afternoon in Zambia and morning or evening somewhere else. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Yes, I can hear you, Nassim. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Huh. This is Nassim from, uh, from India, so I'm Sikshan Priyo, and I am a member of Vairu Commission, and we are, uh, 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 we are working with women farmers uh, in India, uh, which is uh, across seven states of India. Uh, women farmers, all women farmers are uh, closely uh, working on the climate and agriculture uh, resilience for food security and uh, climate adaptation. And my, my pers uh, per personally, I'm involved with Swam Section Priyog in last 29 years to empower uh, women as a leader for their community change. So, so here uh, I'm going to share my experience with the women leaders, how they are involved in their communities and how, they are, how we are working for the uh, resilience building in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nassim. And last but no, not least, Sony. Hi, um, my name is Zonibel Woods. I'm a social development specialist with the Asian Development Bank. Um, my work focuses mostly on uh, the intersection uh, between um, gender and climate change. I've been working on this issue first um, on uh, women's rights within sort of environment and sustainable development. Um, and that has obviously, for obvious reasons, evolved into working more on the intersection between climate change and, uh, and gender. Um, at ADB, uh, we work um, quite substantively on mainstreaming um, gender, and we have um, a target of 75% of, of all our projects um, have to be gender mainstream. So I'll be talking a little bit about that later. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you all for your introduction. So let's just jump into it. 
The first question for you panelists is to reflect on the comments about women's climate leadership that came up. And I'd love you to reflect on how these uh, comments from the audience relate to your own conceptualization of women's climate leadership. So um, can I start with Amira, please? Sure, uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, women's uh, climate leadership, what it means to me. I think um, many of the comments in here uh, represent part of what we are uh, working on and um, precisely means to be part, fully part of the discussions, fully part of uh, decision making. Um, and in the planning, designing on different type of initiatives at the territorial level, national on inter or international level addressing climate change. I think one of the main uh, issues to address is that uh, women across the world, I think, are trying to, to be recognized as a peer, as an agent of change, and as a political actor that has a voice their own perspective and roles that are critical to address climate change, adaptation, climate change mitigation, resilience, and across the world, women has been demonstrating that has been at the front line and has been addressing the most critical moments. And as just to remind all of us, we just said, uh, getting out of, are uh, getting out of the global pandemic, COVID-19, and at the territorial level, women were at the front line addressing all the additional complications that the COVID brought, besides addressing resilience to address the, the, the uh, pandemic, bringing back their traditional knowledge on medicines, on food sovereignty, and, and resilience to be able to address uh, the accumulations of the different uh, hardship that communities were uh, suffering and are still uh, trying to overcome and women's roles and all these uh, phases of uh, pressures and their capacity to continue mobilizing, continue contributing with their roles in the local economies. Uh, are still being uh, a base for uh, addressing and overcoming the diff difficult situation. So I repeat, women need to be seen as a peer in all discussions of climate change, agents of change, and as a political actor vis-a-vis -vis everybody else. Thank you so much for such a rich insight into women's climate leadership. Chitembo, would you like to reflect on this as well? Yes, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, picking it up from where Umaira said, has mentioned, when we understand and appreciate who is most affected by climate change, its impacts, the shocks that come with it, it's the woman at the center of this all. <clears throat> um, when you consider the effect it has at household food security, when you consider the effects of climate change for the girl child to go to school or for the boy child to, to be able to attend to his chores, it's the women who are most um, heavily affected by, by that. And they are the ones that, it's, it's somehow natural that the women always have to look out for the other person. Not that I'm saying the men don't do that, but the women are more quickly reactive, uh, trying to be proactive. And so if we leave them out in addressing the issues of climate change, if they're put on the sidelines, or if they are put on a way where you feel sympathetic towards them in addressing issues of climate change, then definitely we can't see the results that we intend to see as a global community uh, towards enhancing um, towards responding to climate change. Hence, when I saw these reflections coming from the audience, 
it's um it's gratifying to know that we're all sort of coming to the center realizing the the really need for ensuring there's equity and of course sustainability because um if we leave out the women who are most affected, decisions are made on their behalf on what needs to be done or how that should be done, then we don't anticipate the sustainability in the interventions that are going to be put in place. So this uh, is, is, is good. It's, we need to all be deliberate and intentional about it, that the women are given the space to lead. And there are several examples that we can share that have happened uh, on the programs that I've been working on, especially the PPCR program right here in Zambia, where women have taken charge of their own destiny around the climate shock, beyond what were given as the investments to address the shocks that they, they perceived around the risk planning that they did. They said, we need to go into these interventions. We found that those activities, those sub-projects that were funded in that manner have expanded beyond the initial submission. They are, they are growing. Uh, Tembo, I might come back to you on that really <laughs> successful case about demonstrating a point about sustainability, which you're making. Um, so um, we've heard some great things already. Amaria talking about the roles, what roles that women should have as peers, as political leaders. Uh, Chitembo making a point about sustainability, that we need sustained um, investment in women um, and how they can continue on if if we give them the the tools too. Um, so can I come to you, Zonabel, to reflect quickly on these questions around women's climate leadership? Sure, just very quickly. Um, I won't uh, repeat what has already been said, which I think are all very important um, points. Um, but you know, quite um, Quite succinctly, I think if we um, if we look at women's climate leadership, that's four billion solutions that we're talking about, and so you know these four billion women on the planet at the moment could bring innovation. They can bring skills um, that um, they already have, you know, which really sort of links back to um, what Omara was talking about in terms of. Uh, women at the community level, indigenous women, there's a lot of traditional knowledge there already that we should be using to address the climate crisis. I think, um, you know, uh, we are in a crisis and therefore we really need everyone's talent and contributions. And so um, women's climate leadership is essential um, for those solutions. And I think finally, um, we know, and there's plenty of data that talks about how with women's involvement, we get better um, development outcomes. And so if what we're looking for is building resilience, then I think women are critical and women's climate leadership is critical for that. I'll stop there, over to you. Thank you, Zoni. We need an all hands on deck approach, a whole of society response, so we cannot leave women behind. Thank you for that point. And Nassim, over to you. Uh, for me, uh, women's leadership, uh, women's climate leadership means women are at the forefront of community and they are the uh, in charge of their own communities. So here, uh, all the time, women are demonstrated through their organizing, how they are supporting to the uh, one side, they are supporting to their com com community to, port, uh, to safeguard their community. And other hand, they are trying to um, come back with the natural uh, uh, calamities and the day-to-day -day, um, climate uh, climate related issues in their community. So uh, they are champion, they know how to deal this. And uh, because of the only strength, they, they are organized and they are uh, always trying to innovate themselves uh, to develop uh, innovative practices in their community. As uh, my other colleagues and other friends say, uh, for food security, women are responsible for all the uh, all their uh, family responsibility, uh, providing the food, 
safeguarding their their family like in uh, uh, a, a example i can say uh, without women uh, uh, like loss of farmers in our area doing uh, farmer suicide because they they lost their agriculture income but women are there who are standing in uh, behind the, the behind their families and they are keep doing the their work and uh, and even they are finding the new solution by using the, their traditional knowledge uh, how to um, uh, increase the uh, agriculture income because most of the effect uh, climate effect comes on the agriculture and when the agriculture losses the whole family and the community uh, get destroyed so here women are the safeguard for their community so uh, we have to uh, we uh, we see the power there but, uh, but if we can involve them as a as a equal partner uh, when we are planning the climate uh, resilience approach or climate so we we have to see women as a equal partner not in their community and then only we can reach out to the last mile and the unreached community so i will stop here thank you so much nasim you're pointing out that women are already the backbone of many communities providing not only financial livelihoods but also psychological as you're saying they are supporting people from um who are undergoing severe stress from loss of livelihoods because of climate change. Um, so yes, now we've started talking a little bit about some of the pressures that women face. Let's talk more about what the barriers are that women face in, in their leadership on climate actions. So I'll start with you, Amaria. What do you think are the barriers to women's climate leadership? Thank you. I think um, among all women in the world, when we are, uh, are talking about indigenous women, uh, women from local communities or women from Afro-descendant communities in the case of Latin America, we can make a big difference from the rest of us. And uh, just to say that women from these uh, ethnic groups experience a broad and multifaceted and complex spectrum of mutually reinforced and systemic human rights violations. And uh, all these act together to even limit their self-determination and control of the natural resources and uh, control over the way they interact and have a voice. And uh, all this is reinforced uh, by structures of multiple forms of discrimination and marginalization based on gender, class, ethnicity, race, origin, customs, and socioeconomic status. I think uh, when we address climate change action, we need to differentiate into all women ac across the world with ethnic uh, groups. And, uh, and we need to also take into account that uh, indigenous, Afro-descendant and local community. And in general, women from the rural area uh, comprise more than half of the 2.5 billion people that live in the rural areas and depends on the forest and uh, for the and community lands for the livelihood, uh, food security, energy, traditional medicines and cultural and religion and religious traditions. And um, we know that women uh, take primary responsibility for preserving land and resources of communities uh, without enjoying the legal uh, uh, structures that, that their male counterpart has to own and manage land or from what they are really done. And uh, women, women legally own less than 20% of the world's agricultural lands across the world even though they help to manage the 50% uh, under the control of community across the world and different type of communities. Yeah? 
uh, and climate change, as we know, reinforces gender inequalities. It will, it will, it affects differently men and women, depending on their role, responsibilities, and status in different communities. The way women is accepted and not as a peer, as a political actor in the community, um, and. As women, as, as uh, climate change affects livelihoods and systems, food systems, it affects directly women that are in charge of those systems uh, for providing not only for the families, but for the whole community. And also limited access and, and, and make more difficult ac uh, access to land and resources, uh, water, forests, and affect their roles in the communities. Um, so this means that, uh, Women are uh, being affected by the role that are they are already playing, but has not been recognized in terms of their contributions to adaptations and resilience to the many uh, effects of the uh, climate change. And um, so that's why we need to include gender climate adaptation initiatives with a gender lens, focuses on the rights of women, not only gender, uh, in order to use their knowledge put in place their knowledge, recognizing their contribution. And another big area where we are working uh, with communities across Africa, Asia, and Latin America is in the huge gap in direct funding to women and, and direct funding to women lead uh, initiatives, local economies, food security organizations. And uh, there are there are a uh, little record on how women has been receiving funding uh previous uh, uh, research uh, informed that women across organizations without differentiating between indigenous afro descendant and local communities and the rest of women receive less than one percent one percent of all recorded human rights global funding despite then using managing and conserving a community territories that, that are comprised over 50% of the lands that communities across the world are managing. Uh, so uh, there is a big need uh, for helping to lower this barrier, to overcome this barrier. And one of them means supporting communities on the ground, women groups, women associations, women uh, um, uh, networks uh, that are working without any support or very little support from some organizations. And uh, they are working on critical issues that are helping to maintain the health of the planet, the health of the communities, and access to different resources without being recognized and supported directly. Thank you, Maria. You have covered so many different issues that I think are actually reflected already in the in the audience questions yeah. as well in the responses on land rights lack of recognition and delivered some really harrowing statistics about the ownership of land that women have actual control and access to so um can we go now to Nassim you spoke earlier about um the women as the backbone to communities now what do you think are the barriers that women face Yes, uh, women are backbone of the community and their family, but it's still uh, they have a lot of barriers uh, in there. Like the barriers starts from their own family because we have a lot of cultural norms and the priorities. Women get least prioritized in their own uh, in their own family, so they have to uh, they have to. Uh, struggle, fight, and uh, create their own image. So here, uh, in my experience, when we uh, we provided uh, the opportunity to women to how to how to come out from their own families and and organize into the self help groups or the agriculture groups where they can uh, they can demonstrate their potential, what they have as a women. To, uh, to fulfill the family needs by uh, empowering, uh, uh, like by demonstrating economic empowerment of women. Women are uh, uh, involved into the um, 
involved into the economic activities so that that that, that way they uh, they start they created path to come out there from their family so they are overcome the family barriers but still there are a lot of uh, uh, barriers for women at policy level because we uh, there, there are policies uh, as nina said but the policies are not gender responsive they, uh, most of the time we, we see uh, women are not having land access they are not uh, having a land ownership on their name so they, they can't go to any bank or any uh, any um, access to any government uh, schemes but all the policies uh, uh, mainly in agriculture if you can see agriculture as a as a sector where women stands women stand as a laborer still they are doing 80% of the work uh, in agriculture sector so this is a biggest uh, area where we have to think and act for the women how we can bring women into the uh, center of the agriculture work uh, to address the climate issues because women are not having any access for finance flexible finance is uh, very far away from the women but women are not having the uh, uh, normal access to finance women are not having the uh, access to technology now the whole world is talking about the digital digital literacy digital technology all these things but women are uh, women are always kept behind for that so the uh, uh, like whatever the support we are getting uh, it is very few if if the policy will provide that support to the women about the finance about the technology about the markets even even about uh, even in the market space also men are uh, like uh, male dominated spaces are there women enabling markets are not there and alternative business models are not there where women farmers can go and they can sell their produce so climate one side they are having facing lot, a lot of barriers from the climate and other side policy programs and the culture and financial mechanisms are keeping them behind still they are doing their best to make themselves visible in the community i think i will stop here Thanks so much, Nassim, for pointing out that there are both explicit and in implicit barriers to women at different levels of society. So in the, in the market, in policy, in the government, and at home, women face implicit barriers. And there are these, in turn, turn into explicit barriers, which are policies that are limiting for women. Um, as Omaria pointed out earlier, these are issues around land ownership as well, where women don't have access. So uh, can I come to you now, Zoni, to maybe turn the table a little bit and talk about the enablers of women's leadership from based on your experience? Um, okay, sure. Um, it's, but, you know, there's a couple of things. I just wanted to um, just uh, go back to a few points that were made um, in the previous slide that I think are, are really um, important to underline. Um, one of them is that, you know, we have uh, limited data. So I think, you know, in what um, what my previous colleagues were talking about, about sort of generally the lack of understanding of sort of women's uh, real role in agriculture, the issues of intersectionality um, that were brought up by, by Omara. I think these are really important. And this is where, you know, um, as boring as it is to talk about data, I think that one of the biggest barriers is that um, we have really limited understanding of how climate change is affecting women. And so when we're trying to make a case with policymakers, with um, governments, with um, other colleagues even working on um, environment or climate change, we don't necessarily always, and with donors, we don't necessarily always have the data to support um, sort of what we're saying. And, and a lot of times it's still kind of anecdotal. 
And so I think that's a really um, key barrier that we're starting to overcome, you know, in terms of how we look at farmers. It's always about the male. The data is mostly around the male farmer. Um, and we don't quite understand sort of women's roles in agricultural value chains. It's the same thing with fishing and so on. So I think data is really important. Um, others talked about social and, and cultural norms. And I just wanted to say, you know, we have uh, a, a barrier, particularly in the transition um, to green economies and blue economies, you know, we have a very real labor market segregation where women are not equally participating in the labor market. And in Asia and the Pacific, which is the region that I work on, um, I mean, as, aside from the fact that we have um, women disproportionately represented in the informal sector, we um, are a region where women's labor market participation has actually been going down. And so, um, and when you uh, put that against sort of the fact that we are, um, undergoing sort of a green transition where we need, um, you know, women to be entering into the renewable energy um, related careers, for example, um, where we need um, STEM education for girls, um, you know, that is, that is a, a, a big barrier for us. And then um, on this slide also, uh, a few people put access to resources. And I think this is also when we were talking about um, climate finance in particular, it's about sort of really looking at how much um, of climate finance is actually going to benefit women and girls directly. And OECD and um, Oxfam have done some research on this. And, um, you know, they looked at sort of the percentage of um, OECD DAC resources that um, were actually going, um, climate finance that was actually going to women. And I think it was like, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I think it was like less than, than um, I think 7% or something like that, maybe even four, but not significant amounts. And this is gender mainstreamed. And then the, the, um, the amount of uh, resources that is actually uh, of climate finance that is going to women's organizations is even less. It's not even 1%. So I think we have a huge issue with, um, with the amount of resources that are being put in women's hands. Now, you asked me about the enablers, and I think those are some of the enablers. You know, we actually need to have um, gender responsive climate finance at all levels. And so that means really investing in projects that will bring transformational changes to women's lives that will directly invest in women, not, um, you know, and, and uh, not just um, sort of consider sort of gender mainstreaming, but actually make those resources intentionally dedicated to um, getting to women at the community level. I think that's really important. We've heard how um, you know, critical the role is in, in building resilience at the community level. So we need to be getting those resources into um, community women's hands. And um, you know, another enabler as has been mentioned as, as a barrier, but you know, we still have a lot of work to do around um, legal uh, frameworks, laws, and policies to ensure that they are um, gender responsive and that they are informed by the needs um, that women have. So whether it's, uh, you know, disaster risk management laws, whether it's, um, you know, agricultural policies um, in, um, you know, starting from um, the the ensuring that national adaptation plans, national disaster programs, um, and other sort of policies that fall under climate change, that they are actually um, gender mainstream, gender informed, and that women have been part of the decision making process in getting to these plans. Um, so I think in terms of enablers, um, you know, it is really the flip side, working on the flip side of all the the different, um, you know, barriers that we have mentioned. And I think um, 
you know, some something that doesn't um, get uh, mentioned very much, and but I think it's also important to bring up here is the um, addressing uh, the uh, role that uh, women have, the multiple roles and, and care responsibilities. So, you know, as countries are transitioning to green economies, um, why can't um, child care policies also be addressed and seen within the context of how important they are as an enabler for women to really participate in both green and blue economies and in addressing climate change. And uh, finally, sort of linked to that, I think one of the other issues that is critical is, is looking at our education systems and really working with the education systems so that we have um, climate change education um, where uh, young people, um, both boys and girls, grow up with some of those sort of critical skills that will be needed for um, for addressing the climate um, crisis, as well as incorporating sort of um, principles of um, broadly equality and, um, and justice, but more importantly, um, gender um, equality in the education system, which I think would go a long way in sort of helping young people confront the climate crisis. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Zoni, for really helping us think that, yes, definitely, we need to think of the barriers when we think about the enablers, because the flip side is of the barriers are the enablers and vice versa. So Chitembo, I know you started off giving us a really good example when you spoke to us earlier. So let me come back to you on talking about the enablers or the barriers, whichever you want to. Thanks, and um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what my other colleagues have, have since spoken about both the barriers and uh, the enablers. And listening to the many barriers, you start wondering whether we are doing much already or we need to do a little bit much more to unlock uh, women leadership in climate change. Uh, there's so many barriers that have been mentioned so I, want, I would want to start it from a government perspective on having recognized the barriers as they have been put out this in this session. Uh, it takes uh, first at constitutional level to recognize the role of women in general development, because if that hasn't been taken care of in any particular nation, it's very difficult to come and recognize that when we start discussing climate change and how the gender issues come into that. In the Zambian case, we have the constitution that provides for women effective participation in development and also to be given uh, decisions, the level, uh, positions of decision-making, not only just in government, but also quasi-government institutions and everything that the government is working on and or incidental to. So that gave opportunity when it came to ensuring that our response to climate change is gender responsive. Not taking away the fact that there's still a lot more work to be done because of the, um, the high literacy, illiteracy levels in the rural areas, the low access to former education facilities, but that is a plus because it has given uh, room for us to invest in the women, provided that there's uh, that political, that uh, legal framework that provides for that. And then the climate change policy in Zambia did identify the key sectors that are affected by climate change. And of course you find there's water, there's land, uh, there's forest, and earlier on, um, Nassim was speaking on how women are in the agrarian land and uh, they don't have access to land. Because, and so that complication, that makes us of access to capital resources, access to finances comes up as you are implementing climate change. So that recognition in the policy on climate change makes us move beyond how do we address the effects of women in cli on climate change, taking into consideration their limitations uh, due to not having uh, land and, and all. 
But again, we, we run back to the, the laws that provide for women to have, uh, when any land, parcels of land are being given out, the government of Zambia is, has made a deliberate policy to say 30% of any land that is being given out should be reserved for women only. So there's room there. And that means, again, they'll still get access around the 70% that remains for any other sectors and all. So there's need for being deliberate and being intentional to ensuring that the women have got space in decision making, that the women have got uh, space in championing actions around climate change or actions in any development space. And we went further as a country to also bridge the gap between what at the time there was just a gender policy and then the climate change policy came in place. So how do we ensure that what these two policies are talking about is affected on the ground, takes shape, uh, takes root and starts being implemented uh, everywhere else. So there's the climate change and climate change gender action plan that brings all these together to say, how then do we get to do this? It, it, it explains the actions, it explains the, the hows, how do we get the women to do? And for us, that is what gave room and authority to give the women champions access to financing, which is very difficult if it was just left alone. So you have these women, women groups that get access to financing, but you don't just give them financing. So you look at some of those barriers mentioned, like they have limited access to land. So in accessing that financing, you link it to say, if I'm going to give you financing, where are you going to undertake your investments? Oh, we'll do it in area B, X, and Y, but do you have land rights to that area? No, we don't. Okay, fine. So if you don't have, can we get the application and then work through the local authority and the traditional leadership gets on board to make that land be accessible to the women? So they get to have access to this land, not just at the time that they're making the investments through this financing, but that's a low lifetime um, access to land. So in providing the access to the funding, you also ensure that some of the barriers such as lack of access to land, which is critical, uh, decision-making because it's just a women's group, now they're able to make their own decisions. And at times it's very interesting, you find that they coped in one or two men. And the reason being, is there are certain hard jobs that we women can do. So we cooked in these two men, they'll be dealing, dealing much of the tilling because we, we can't do it as women, or it will take us much longer time to take away much of our other time we need to do other things. So they can cooked in one or two, which we found very interesting to say, how can the men now be able to work alongside a multitude of women and then they're just to the two of them. So you start seeing this transformation happening in our, in our societies because of the being deliberate and being intentional about addressing the barriers of uh, women in climate change through creating the enabling environment um, in that. Um, the holistic support to, to women in, in climate uh, leadership is, is very critical. So as I've mentioned about, they have access to finance, they have got access to, to land now. But so what do we do with these women who've never, being able culturally, being able to lead themselves and be able to voice out or hold right this. So you bring in financial literacy, you bring in um, group management dynamics, you, you bring in skills that they start opening up their minds to so there's so much that we can do with our lives and grow. But these are niches which are being done and there's needs to expand and grow them and tell the story so that we build on them uh, to ensure that everything that is being done is not only climate responsive, but also gender responsive. Uh, so Tempo, I'll have to ask you to wrap up since we only have one minute left. Yeah, so all in all is having the, I'll conclude by saying that having an enabling policy and legal framework supported by good political will ensures that clim uh, climate uh, women climate leadership is, is championed. So it helps to unlock the barriers that stop the women to, to move to that. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you everyone for such a rich discussion. Um, we are out of time right now, but we have covered so many different things from different barriers in different contexts to success stories. Um, as Chitembo was demonstrating, a policy that is actually uh, gender considerate and how that can enable women's climate leadership. So um, we have an interactive section now, which is going to involve the audience. So audience, uh, get your thinking hats ready and I'll hand over now to Emma. And thank you again, panelists, for such amazing insights and really hope that we can talk together again sometime. Thanks very much, May, and, and I hope everyone will forgive me not turning my camera on. Um, I'm joining from South Africa and our coal transition is certainly not advanced enough and we're currently experiencing six hours of load shedding a day, so I'm, I'm hot spotting. Uh, um, so won't, won't test my bandwidth to try and add my video as well. Um, Catherine has reshared the Mentimeter link and should be sharing screen shortly. There we go. Um, for our kind of closing question, which is going to the audience, um, which is in your perspective, what is needed to strengthen women's climate leadership for local um, for LA in your country or area of work? Um, a few people um, already completed this when when this came up earlier, um, but but for those of you who didn't, or maybe the panel discussion has prompted additional thoughts or reflections that you'd like to add, um, and we'll we'll invite you to pop those in now. Um, and we're a bit tight on time, but may even be able to um, invite some audience members to um, to to share a bit more as well. Um, uh, by unmuting themselves. Um, I see what's been included already is intentional finance, um, formalizing roles and focus. Um, I'm Intentional finance I think is well understood, but in terms of formalizing roles, um, I wonder if that is reflecting um, perhaps those unrecognized and, and unvalued um, roles that women often play in many of these landscapes and, and in households and communities. Um, but whoever added that, if you if you do want to elaborate more on that, please do go ahead and and similarly focus. Um, I, I can perhaps read into that and assume that that's referring to um, having that kind of dedicated visibility and attention on um, women's climate leadership and in um, including those elements. Um, as we all know, the the risk of of being gender neutral is is ending up being gender blind. Um, and it's even in the best of conditions, always good to make sure that we are including that recognition and that consideration um, of, of men and women's roles within these different spaces. Um, is the is the meant to me to link working? I'm not seeing any new additions coming up. Um, so I just want to make, oh, there's one in the chat. Thank you, David, is to support intentional policies, support women's roles and voices. Great one. Um, Obviously, those formal institutions are very important. Advocate for women's agency, another great one um, coming through. Um, is there anyone that would like to unmute themselves um, and speak more to the point that they've raised, or even to reflect on anything that, that the panelists have raised, the discussions about barriers and enablers, um, or perhaps to share um, briefly a, a particular case or instance um, in their own communities, or organizations um, that, that might be um, worth sharing now. Please, please do go yes. ahead. Yeah, thank you. This is Omaira Bolanos and I wanted to share something and I'm gonna paste in the, in the chat uh, as a way to support and break the bias against women's finance. Uh, there is a, a global uh, uh, initiative among indigenous, Afro-descendant, and local community women across the world that are already supporting in making a call uh, to climate finance to uh, ensure that indigenous, Afro-descendant, and local community women are not behind, are not left behind in the promises that has been done in the COP26 in the finance uh, promises to indigenous uh, communities across the world. And uh, there is a call to action um, um, defined by 
41 organizations across the world led by women and that are defining what are the areas where donors should pay attention to fund women's efforts on the ground and what are the issues that donor community and government needs to adjust change to make funding available to indigenous afrodescendant and local community women and among all that uh, i just want to highlight uh, one is uh, to allocate dedicated funds to secure women's access ownership of land forest resources water and the decision making access ensure funding to allow women to prepare for dialects with governments donors and climate change scenarios uh, to bring their uh, their knowledge and perspective and uh, general call for donors to ensure that the compliance with the standards and accountability and transparency of governments on the, on the funding that they are providing to governments ensure compliances uh, to the promises of achieving gender equity and women's representation and support and conscience to donors also conscious efforts to distribute Build information about funding opportunities to indigenous, Afro-descendant, and local communities, women. There are little access to information. Sometimes it say, goes to certain groups, but not all. And to ensure um, the legal and administrative uh, mechanisms are simplified. That means easy to follow, not so complicated to understand, to make effective funding uh, opportunities to reach women. I have pasted in the link information and feel free to contact us at Rise and Resources Initiative uh, for this information. We were pretty much, I'm going to uh, launch this at the COP and um, the formalization of the network that will try to speak at different scenarios. They need to fund women's organizations on the ground, women's groups and associations, and the way uh, indicating some ways to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amara. And we obviously recognize that the intersectionality is obviously mm -hmm. a, a crucial aspect in, in any kind of discussions of, of women's climate leadership, both in terms of um, diversity of um, uh, indigeneity and race and culture and caste and, and, and the like, um, as well as even going to within gender diversity itself. Um, I see there's some additional comments in the um, chat. Um, unfortunately, we've, we, we've run out of time, um, but, but there are some sharing of links and the like. Um, uh, I see uh, Zani has also shared some more information about the ADB's Community Resilience Partnership Program, and, and I think we'll be able to share those links as well in a, in a wrap-up email. I see um, a few more people have added to shift gender stereotypes, formalize, um, social dialogues, and strengthening women's organizations. Um, before we close, um, we're going to add one more Mentimeter that will trigger now, but we won't be sharing the results on this page, but it's essentially just a way for us to capture your information if you're interested in um, continuing to engage in the Women's Climate Leadership Initiative, you can um, pop your email in there. And if you're not active on the um, Mentimeter link, you're also welcome to get in touch with us directly um, and we can make sure that you're included in any follow up consultations. Um, as well as being notified when those knowledge products have been released. Um, we also invite you to, if you have any additional submissions or thoughts or reflections from the session, um, please feel free to, to send those on to us as we um, refine and revise that, that research and those knowledge products. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Nina to close us off again. Um, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Nina, over to you. Uh, well, thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, this was really a, a very engaging discussion with a lot of uh, very practical points for going forward. Um, and and as, as, as we've started um, in, in the beginning, um, 
saying that we we feel that that this this session is is not just a discussion in general, but a very direct uh, contribution to the knowledge product that we're working on, and that we will also be using um, the findings of this knowledge product for very uh, actionable recommendation for the investment project. So definitely, the subject of how to get that finance uh, down to the local level uh, and and um, empower empower women to be uh, to be driving the decisions to to be prepared to 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 be more actively engaged uh, seemed to be like a, a a theme that was going across all, all the discussions and um, looking forward to to really continued engagement on that. Thank you, Nina, and thank you everyone for joining this session. I don't know if there, um, the panelists have final um, words to close and wrap up this session. And if not, then we invite you all. Yeah, Nassim, I see your, yeah, your microphone. I want to say, I want to say like uh, when we are looking uh, at women's leadership in climate change, we should not look women as a victim. We should see women as an equal partner of the climate change issues to tackle climate change at the community level. And we have to invest them because without investment, we can't see the results. So I, I, I invite all the donors, all the partners and uh, policy makers, they should invest into the women in which uh, in women's groups and especially grassroots women because they are at the forefront of the, their communities uh, and provide them flexible financing mechanisms in their hands and invite them as an equal partner at the policy make, uh, design and implementation. So thank you. Thank you, Nassim. Equal partnerships, flexible financing, devolving decision making to the grassroots level. I cannot find better words to close uh, and wrap up this session. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining and uh, keep engaged in other CBA sessions. Um, if you do want to keep engaged in this initiative, please share your email with us and we will we will add you to our, our list of, uh, of in interested um, participants and, and stakeholders. And um, thank you again for joining.